I'm Jim Walton, and this is my daughter, Mitzi, and this is our Dodge Charger. When Mitzi wrote me on Facebook and she told me the story about the car, and then I saw the pictures of the car back in the day, saw that it had pretty much carried and, and raised a family, and then a second family, you know, as generations go on. I think that the story offset the rarity of the car. We just wanted a car that we could travel around the country with, and we liked the color. I can't tell you enough about how much the backstory means. When you start hearing the story, you hear Jim talking about when he's a young man and just starting his family, he wanted a car big enough to haul everybody, but yet still got good gas mileage. He wanted to take his family all over the United States on vacations in this car and be able to afford to do it. Remember, gas was probably 50 cents a gallon. <laughs> it's 1972. So he was thinking economy. When the uh, car is finished and we receive it back, I'm gonna keep it here in, in Springfield and for about a year and drive it and just enjoy it. Eventually, they'll give it to their oldest son. He will have it until he's done with it, and then it'll go on to maybe my youngest son, and then the two boys will be in charge of which grandchild gets it, who is able to take care of it and honor it and keep it the way it should be kept so it always stays in the family. I love you, Dad. I love you, too. Very few people still have their original cars after 43 years, so. Yes. You're a good Glad man, to, Charlotte yeah. Brown. <laughs> Thank you Great very much. Great to see you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> now that they are gone, it's time to knuckle down and get some work done on the car. And in the case of Jim and Mitzi's car, um, very solid car, the only metal that we had to replace was that roof skin, which we were lucky and had a 71 satellite out back. Most people don't realize 71 and 74 satellite, 71 and 74 B-body, the roof sections are the same. Well, they would if they were a car person wow. usually, or a Mopar guy. So in that case, all we had to do was replace the roof skin and then we could start doing the body work. It was a pretty straight car, so mm -hmm. there wasn't much filler on it at all. Primer it, once the primer's done and kicked off, it was ready to move over to the paint guys so they could do the block, prime, block, prime, paint. It's interesting when you're doing a stencil on a blackout versus doing like the uh, V21 blackout on the black Challenger. So when you're normally on most of the cars when you're doing it, you just got a great big vinyl graphic, you get it wet, put your application gel on there, you place it where it's supposed to go, you make your marks, and you begin squeegeeing it out, and that can be a long, tedious process. In the case of the mask that you got, like Phoenix Graphics supplied us with the mask, that's, the, that's just like a graphic that's put on the hood, except it's in reverse, right? The area, mm -hmm. instead of having black vinyl in there, is wide open so that you can actually paint the surface. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to be very careful. I tried on that one to put the gel on it and move it around a little bit. That masket paper is not designed to do that. It is designed to come back up though. But every time you touch it down and you pull it back up again, you take the chance of distorting it. Mm -hmm. So you really should make your measurements, put that thing down on there, get it all sealed around the edges, run around every square inch with your finger and making sure that that masket paper is touched really well against the actual paint of the car. Right. Then you can go around the whole thing with the scuff pad. When you're scuffing it, if it's not scuffed right, that paint will blow right back off again. Mm. So you've got to have it scuffed, you've got to get down. If this is the groove right here where the rally stripe is, you need in there, and if you go too hard, you can roll that paper back up. So you just take your time and just work it around until that thing is dull, until that paint's dull and you know you're going to get adhesion. Once that's done, you can clean it, blow it, turn the fan on, and go mix up your stuff. Uh, in the case of that blackout on the hood, it's the exact same cocktail that we use whenever something needs to be blacked out, like the, the AAR, the AAR, the tops of the fenders and the hood on the AAR, which right. actually goes into the tops of the doors and the quarters. You know that instead of a belt molding, it's kind of cool. It kind of emulates the original black matted finish that the factory put on it, except it's done in today's acrylic urethane. So I right. use an acrylic urethane uh, single stage paint, but I put a flattening agent in it. And with the right amount of reduction and the right amount of flattening agent in it, you can get that stuff to blush off like that and leave that nice matte finish. What's nice about that versus a rattle can black, because you could make it look the same with a rattle can, a rattle can, number one, would streak. You would have streaks in it that would not look very good. Number two is you could walk right up to it with a lacquer thinner and just wipe it off. Right. You can't touch catalyzed urethane once it's cross-linked together. So it's more durable, it'll hold up. The way it looks now is the way it's going to look 20 years from now. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. It's cool. Kind of stuff they ask of me. Well, good brain. Time is starting to run out on the 72 Charger delivery date. We need to really light a fire under everybody and do as much multitasking as possible to get that car done on time. 
So I'm installing the uh, the decals that go in the rally doors. We got pretty crazy with the graphics in 72. In the 60s, 1970, and 1971, it was all about power. Now, now Chrysler fused power and wild looks together in 70 and 71 on their E-bodies and some of their B-bodies. Yeah. But in 72, because the kids were getting killed and the insurance rates were going out of sight and the fuel was so expensive, they pulled back on the horsepower, but they wanted the cars to stay flashy. Mm. And so they continued to get wilder and wilder with the graphics. Mm -hmm. I remember in 71, the scallops had two scallops two that went up and down like this. In 72, it had four of them went five of them that went like that. Yeah. And those had a strobe stripe in them. Again, a wild graphic that when you put them up against the yellow cars, they just pop off of there. You add that in with um, the the rear stripe, the, the rally stripe that went on the back end of that car. Very difficult stripe to install, by the way. So I'm putting a piece of tape right here on this line to show the very center line of the lock cylinder. Because this has a lock cylinder cut out in it, but when it's on there, you can't really see it because you've got a reverse curve that's just like that, and you're putting a flat decal on it. And so getting this half to stick and then that half to stick without having an air bubble in the middle of it's really difficult. Same yeah. thing out on the quarter ends. But when you're done putting all that ornamentation on there, the decals in the doors, the uh, rear stripe on the back end of it, the hood blackout on it, it just pops. The thing on that when it comes to the graphics that I didn't understand is that whole car was loaded with the rally package, yeah. everything. It had it all, it even had a tachometer for a 318. Everything was rally. It should have had the stripe on the back end, but you can clearly see in the original pictures of the car that it didn't. But for whatever reason, whether it was an oversight, whether somebody just forgot to put it on, or whether somebody before Jim got the car just decided, I don't like it on there and I'm gonna take it off. Yeah. I felt that since it's such a good looking decal, and it is just a decal, that we'd put it on there. And I'm glad that right. we did because it really made the back end of the car pop. I had actually played with the center of the hole and matching up the actual opening in the decal itself. And if I had brought it down to perfect center and left and right to perfect center, it would have looked like crap on the back of the car. It would have been too low in it. The actual decal at the bottom would have been hanging over a half of an inch and rolled up. So I selected the best of all of the worlds in the way of centering it left to right, up to down, and still maintaining the spirit of the original graphic on there. I just finished building the long block out for uh, Mitzi and Jim's 72 Dodge Charger. All I've got left now are just the bolt-on things, the intake manifold, exhaust manifolds, timing cover, water pump. I recently had somebody ask me this question and I was just asked it again. Why are we doing everything under one roof? Have you been around shops that do the mechanical under one roof, the body under one roof, all of the painting under one roof, the assembly under one roof? I mean. By everything being done under one roof, you control your destiny. You know where the cars are, you know where the parts are, you know what the end result is gonna be, and you're in control of being able to deliver that. Mm -hmm. So that's why we do everything under one roof. I don't think many people do, but eventually I'd like to be able to do everything. I'd like to be able to make the nuts and bolts someday, but I don't think that'll happen. Hmm. Huh? Good, huh? Wow. All right, so where I'm at now is the motor's basically put together. I just gotta put the water pump and the harmonic balancer on it, and then I can roll it out, clean it down, mask a couple of ports off and it's ready to paint. Because when you're non-high performance, like this is just a 318 two barrel, um, it doesn't go the Hemi Orange. Typically every engine you see us paint out there in the paint shop is Hemi Orange, but this one actually goes the corporate blue. Somewhere around 71, 72, Chrysler was changing over. And so you started seeing that corporate blue come in. You saw it in the 7318, but you saw it by 71, it was in on almost all the engines, except for I think the 440 was still orange. By 73, they were all corporate blue. So while, it's, uh, while it is a cool color, and I understand that they were just mainstreaming for it, I think that Chrysler was playing down the muscle and building up just the fact that it's a good car and, and it's a nice looking engine. But if you had a 69 440, it should be Hemi orange. If you had a 70, it should be Hemi orange. Depending on the year of the Hemi, they also had different colors. Did you know that? 66, 67 were different colors. Uh, orange. orange. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the air cleaners were also a different color from that. I'm surprised you didn't know all that. You can give us a chance to say it. I think we're going to have a good day today at Graveyard Cars. The 318 is painted corporate blue and ready to go on to the K member and the stand. Uh, our goal today is to get the motor put onto the stand, build it out as much as we can with the parts that we have, and reunite it with the 72 Charger. I like putting together the whole entire front end. Having the uh, the, the holy sacred union. Yes, the <laughs> the uh, engine to the K member, marrying the transmission to the engine, getting it installed. I would have I, to say it's one of the best parts of the whole thing because prior to that, it's just a car. Yep. It's just a body shell. It's just sitting there. 
But when you put that engine together with the transmission, all the pieces bolted onto it, the, the cooling lines, the fans, the hoses, the belts, the wiring harnesses, everything is on there. Marry that to the K-member with all the suspension, upper and lower control arms, in and out of tie rod ends. You know all the pieces mm -hmm. that go on. Once you're done that, it's ready to go in the car. You lower that car down around that engine and transmission, you raise it back up in the air with them together. Mm. For the first time, that's a car. You got the heart? It's ready. Oh, oh, inspection God. cover got to go on first. What cover? It goes over all this. Oh, you know what we forgot. Where's the shield? One of my better attributes is finding fault and mistakes as the others have made here at GYC. I guess that's actually a good thing. Mark, is this the only thing? That is it, yes. OK. Because without that shield in there, you know, besides having rocks and gravel, it'd be a few pounds lighter, too. <laughs> Speaking of being lighter, how's your Weight Watchers doing? See, that's the f***ing problem right there. Well, you know, so, uh, the, the front end aside and working our way back, we, Derek and I did get the rear end installed. We got the leaf springs, we got it put onto the actual rear end housing. I was going to say, you guys did a good job on that. The brake. Brake backing plates looked right. The shoes, everything was had the right color, the right fit. The housing had the right sheen to it. The leaf springs looked great. The shackles at the back, the hangers in the front, everything looked right. I thought you did a good job on it. Thank you. A real good job. Well, I'm Larry Fortner, and I'm Larry's Interior in Cresswell, Oregon. And uh, I come out and do Mark's tops for him and put the headliners in. And I've been doing it over 40 years. One of the things that I think is the best about Larry is that he'll come here and do the work. Yeah. And you remember in the past, we were taking him across town to some of those people, and they were charging twice as much as Larry yeah. and taking twice as long, and you always run the risk of moving a car. Yeah. And again, care, custody, and control. I like it when I got control over a car, when I can know, walk out my shop and see it. Yeah. So uh, he does a good job on it. He does it for a fair price. And I think the truth of the matter is he was doing these vinyl tops when there were vinyl tops on cars, right. where a lot of these shops the kids that are working in them today don't even know what vinyl tops are. Right. So this is the emblem that goes on the deck lid of the car. OK, now that I got it cut out, I'm going to go in and just make sure it goes in the right spot. You know, when I looked at the original photos of that Charger nameplate it on the back, it was down on the right-hand side. And it, I've seen that many times. I've, I mean, these were mass-produced cars. The guys didn't care. Like I say, a lot of them were like Darren. You know, they weren't just really. Just put the emblem on it and get it over with. Well, it's an emblem. Just put it on and go. No, because you want to emulate the way the factory did it. And if the they did it wrong. Put it on Ma well, they when, probably well. didn't. I got it. What's the hardest part, do you think, of reassembling the dash with Derek and putting it in the car? You know, Derek and I worked together the whole entire process, mm -hmm. and that made it go by a lot quicker. And him and I kind of hit a few roadblocks, but we just came in here to the books, Dave Wise's books, mm -hmm. and got as much research as we could on it. How do you like connecting it? Because there is a bit of a balancing act there when you got that thing and you're anchoring it up into place. Right. What about all the wires? I mean, normally I'm the guy in there doing it. In this case, were you the guy hooking everything up? Um, or Derek and you both? Yeah, together? Derek and I both did it. You know, he's trying to walk me through it. Each step of the way, Derek was telling me, this is what you have to do. This goes here. You know, and he was doing it very efficiently. Wait, really? It took like five minutes. No joke. Nice. If that. I mean, it, it just went right in. We lifted it up screwed in the uh, the screws up top, uh, tightened the screws down in the, the door area, and it was it was well, You did all that without fighting and in, in, infighting and calling each other bad names? Yep. Well, nice. Coming at it from a different angle, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the big components we're getting ready to put on now is our exhaust system. Again, we get those from Accurate Exhaust. So what's up with the machine gun tips? That, Is it that horsepower? That car never came with machine gun tips from the factory. That car was a, a single exhaust car that he wanted to make look like a, if it were a 340, because that's the only that's the lowest engine level you could have got dual exhaust with machine gun tips. Mm. There's the only significance to it is it they look cool as hell and they sound cool. I mean the tip itself doesn't make any difference in the audio of the actual exhaust. Mm -hmm. Let's first see if it cranks over, Derek. If you want, you can hit the keys, see if the neutral safety system's working. Everything's plugged in, so I hope so. Be nice. Make sure all our fuel lines are Yeah, there's a little bit of a leak. Too. Oh, we don't have a fuel line hooked up down there. Well, I thought you hooked it up. No, Again? Wait a second. Is this the third time? No, I bolted the thing and then went on to something else. 
Sorry. <laughs> Actually, I got pulled off. Third time. Every time we go to start one of these, he forgets to hook up the fuel lines. All that means is the car's got to go back up in the air, connect the fuel lines, and figure out why it won't start. This is classic Royal. Tell the difference there. It's sounding a little different. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to run. <laughs> I've said it before. I'll say it again. When you're having problems on a car, the best thing to do is walk away. Like when Larry showed up with the interior, it was a perfect segue for us to get the hell out of all the problems we were having with the car not running and start putting the interior together. And it was beautiful. He did a great job putting the legendary covers on. They fit the seats really well. They were a nice tight bolster, which sometimes isn't the case. We put all of the interior in it, the back seat, the back door trim panels, armrests, rear package tray, door armrests, door panels in the front got put on, seat belts were put in. I know we got a lot of the trim done on the outside of it. If I remember right, the front windshield, the back windshield, the lower reveal moldings. Uh, a lot of trim and ornamentation along with the interior got put together on that car. And by the time we were done, our heads were cleared again. It was time to go back to the problem. Boy, that's a real thing. Not over there, check that one. Right there, too, yeah. Runs good. Runs really good. Runs good. You know, once, once we had so much done on the car, like the interior in it and the engine running and all the stuff buttoned up, all we had left is a little bit of trim, but it's that little bit of trim and ornamentation on these cars that when it's when you're at the end of a week-long suicide shift of 24 hours straight and you're just exhausted, that's when you can make mistakes. But putting the wheel opening moldings, putting the bumpers on looked beautiful. Darren, go get your bolts. I got them there back here, buddy. Okay, we're gonna go up and in. You wanna tape the fenders a little bit or nothing? No, nope, we're just gonna go in careful here, guide it. Hang on, bud. You can get a bolt started right over here, Chief. OK, these two brackets here. That's the upper ones. Yeah. Does this need to be cleared? And yes, yeah. Uh, probably, yeah. You know, really, the car went together well because it came apart well. If you look back at all my photos in the inventory that we took of the car, it was so complete. Putting the front bumper on was a piece of cake. Putting the grill in it, the grill work, the headlight doors, even the ornamentation that went in that, the lower valance, the front park lamps. All of it came out of the car, so it should go back in it. And it was good. We had Bumper stuff. Depot did a beautiful mm -hmm. job on the bumpers. Absolutely beautiful job. With all the fighting and all the bickering and all the crap that we do, it's two things are amazing to me. One, I don't kill both of you, and Royal, who's never <laughs> here. And two is we seem to pull together and get the car done. And when the cars are done, they're done right, and they look great, and we have happy customers. Sort of like a rectal exam. Yeah. No, being with you is like a rectal exam. <laughs> it's the equivalent of a rectal exam. I would rather have a rectal exam. I would rather have him shove the Hubble telescope up my <laughs> than spend an hour in a car with you. Okay. <laughs>
like back, back in the day when I remember What do you think, it. beautiful? It's absolutely like it? beautiful. Good. You know, it hasn't been this bright for a long time. Being able to see their reaction when the car first pulled up, you know, I didn't realize what I was in for. What's it's and all then, about. You know, bam, all of a sudden, they're all crying. What man can't say that it, it would bring a tear to their eye to see somebody that happy? That guy had desert for eyes. I did, everybody around here was looking for a Kleenex, and it, it looked like he needed Visine. The, Wal the Waltons are good people. It's one of my favorite families that we've worked on any of the cars for. Very emotional family, very close family. It was, it was nice. Great. It was, it's, it's beautiful. And so when you look out there and you see Jim and Mitzi and the kids and the grandkids all in that car and hovering around it and water in the eyes, knowing that their dream has come back around and it's true and that they're gonna enjoy this car for another 40 years, as a person, it makes you feel good. It's a very rewarding feeling. Radiator's been reconditioned, brand new AC condenser. All the pipes for the AC are completely restored or reconditioned. The hoses are all replica original. And look at that thing for Yeah. Step on the gas a little bit. How do you like those tips? Oh, my god. Those are great. See the holes in them? Yeah. Holes. Oh, great. Great. <laughs> god, he got a lead foot. He crazy. Yeah, he's crazy. Wow, that looks new. I think it sounds good. It does sound good, yeah. <laughs> but it was cool. The car did perform well. The car ran good. It tracked good. I felt good about handing it over to Jim and Mitzi and, and the family. And so for, the, for me, the big payoff, of course, is we didn't have any functional problems with the car. And at the end of it all, uh, we had two really happy customers and a whole happy group of all just piled in there, car loads on. Lava, let's get a ticket in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in second gear again. <laughs> there we go. Much better than I thought it would be. It uh, drives good, uh, it's comfortable, uh, upholstering and everything is in it is nice. The whole bunch of us love it. And uh, like Mitzi said, it's, it's going to stay in the family. It's so much fun to ride in again, and it's been so many years. We haven't driven it from probably since 1990, 99, I think was the last time it was driven. So it's pretty exciting to ride around town in it and cruise around. The car just feels good. You know? I'm happy to be able to drive it again. We're very glad that Graveyard Cars took it in and did this for us. And it did, it bring our family back together. And it's you know something that we're sharing out together that not very many families share something like this, and it's really important. And I have my grandson here, too, one of my grandchildren that's sharing it with us, and it's very exciting that he's involved in this, too, because someday he may get the car. I'll keep it until this fall, September, October, something, and then they'll take it to Montana. They'll keep it for a while and give it to the oldest son. He has it for a while until he gets tired of it and it goes to the youngest son, and then down finally to the great grandson. Oh, for sure, always. It'll always be in the family. As long as it runs, it's in the family.